Hello, and welcome to Talking Prog. I am Zoltan Vamos with our hosts, Ryan, Brian, and Thiago. Today, we are joined by our very special guest, Brett Cull of Echolin, a Pennsylvania a band from Pennsylvania where, well, they do really good symphonic prog, and I'm glad to have them here. Um, I'm sure everyone's excited for this conversation. Brett, why not you tell us about yourself? Hello, this is Brett. Thanks for having me, guys. I really appreciate it. I am uh, I'm from Pennsylvania. Uh, I'm a card carrying Gen Xer, born in '66. Um, <laughs> I like all kinds of music. Um, been married twice. Um, what else? That's about it. <laughs> <laughs> I teach at a, I, I teach at a, a couple colleges. Um, oh. I, I'm a producer, engineer. Um, going for my master's degree right now. I just got my undergrad a couple of years ago. Um, yeah, just do anything. I'll, I'll uh, make things out of concrete. I love masonry and cutting grass. And I think, uh, yeah, just jack of all trades. Wow. So what is nice. What are you doing the master's degree in? I'm going to get it in higher education. I've been teaching college uh, for about 12 years at a collegiate level. And it's just sort of funny. I need that rubber stamp, you know, Oh, for me to keep sort of getting into academia. And I love I love teaching. So I might start it in applied technology and then um, and then see where that takes me from there. You know? Right. Perfect. My, my awesome. undergrad my undergrad I got in behavioral science. So that was something I really enjoyed too. Wow. People things and learning about why we do things. So that's a huge interest as well. That's <laughs> incredible. Definitely. Um that that was uh, really really interesting stuff to hear from you. Um, so why not we get into our first subject? Which, um, by the way, Brett, if you already know, um, we have prepared eight questions to each that we can ask you. I will start. Uh, Dad will go uh, second. Ryan third, and Thiago fourth. That was uh, the order that you know seemed a okay. So um, let's get this going. I will start with. Um, um, I do these worst to best on my, uh, on my channel, and I do think that when it comes down to bands on their own, there are members that have their own favorite albums, like, for example, Tony Banks' favorite album by Genesis is Duke. Um, what is, uh, your favorite Echolin album and why? Oh, wow. Uh, my favorite album that we did, well, I have, I have... I like everything from, uh, we did an album called May on. Those are all top-notch, perfect albums for me. My favorite is probably the untitled one that we did in 2012. Um, mm. And with May, May being a close. So again, only because those two were so easy to um, write and record. And, um, you know, they were just um, a pleasure to put together. And yeah, I'm kind of sad that we haven't played anything from those albums, that are actually from the from 2012 on, but I hope to be able to do it sometime. But yeah, those are my two favorites. Yeah. With, with I think the Untitled one from 2012 being the best. Okay, so that answered my second question as well. I'll have to think of something. <laughs> you were right, Dad. Okay, Dad, you go next. <laughs> so I, you know, I was mentioning that uh, you know I started this band, Benjamin's Kite, in 1983, and you know we were doing. Genesis covers in bars and stuff like that. And oh, that's we were so writing cool. we were writing all this long progressive rock from the 70s. And we we did that for three or four years, five years, and you're slogging from record company to record company, and nobody will sign you because nobody wants to hear a 20-minute concept piece. And um, we we changed singers, and at some point around 85 or 86, 87, I'm not exactly sure, I can't remember right now, but uh you know, we, we got involved with a woman who wanted to finance a band. And uh, so she started signing us these deals and sending us into these expensive recording studios. Um, and we didn't really have a record deal yet, but we had all this, you know, available money to record. Um, and we recorded a full album in 86, no, 87, 88. And then we had to shelve the project because uh, that's the singer who was on the album quit. And we decided, well, we don't want to replace the singer. We'll just make a new album. So we got a new singer in and, uh, you know, we made another whole entire album. And this time, as we were doing it, we did it over a period of a year. Um, you know, we started to get some record company interest because I, I think one of it was that we, you know, we st 
tightened the songs a little bit, made them a little bit more commercial. And, you know, we were kind of sounding like, um, you know, that commercials, commercial 80s yes or 80s rush, oh, yeah. maybe, that kind of thing. Yeah. And uh, and our singer was, you know, he had he played in, he liked prog rock, but he also liked mainstream rock. And he sounded a little bit like Brian Adams or Don Henley, maybe. And so, you know, you could you could pass it along to a record company. And, you know, once we got the recording contract and we got the the album out and you're getting played on the radio and you're touring across the country and you're starving to death, um, you know, you realize all the kind of pressures that you get yourself under with a big recording contract. And, you know, it really led to the breaking up of the band by 1993 because you can't get along with the record company when you now insist that you're going to do 11 and 12 minute songs. So I'm just wondering, I think, if I, I hope I'm right about this, that uh, you did get a, a fairly big uh, recording contract for As The World. And uh, I was just wondering if you could tell me what that experience was like. And is, is, that, is that how it happened? And did you guys stay with that record company or did you end up going back and doing things independently? Yeah, great question. Um, we, uh, it was a beautiful experience. I, I, all the guys, we all thought that too. And the only sort of negative thing I would say was that getting signed to the label actually slowed us down because for the three or four years that we were together, um, you know, doing things in a DIY situation, especially if you're a motivated individual, you get things done at your own pace and you create opportunity. Um, you know, the irony is that opportunity of to getting signed to a label was sort of like what was a goal of ours. And then when we got it, you know, everything just slowed down because now you're part of a bureaucracy that, um, you know, we just weren't used to. So that's the only negative thing. But other than that, I mean, it was a dream come true. It's like winning the lottery in a sense where you go from trying to record your own albums. You know, I mean, I bought a tape machine in 1988. I spent six, $7,000 for it back, back when that was the case. And now to have all that stuff being paid for by a company, meaning, you know, recording studios where you're paying 1500 to 2000 a day, you know, um, was just, it's a dream because I, I can't think of anything else I'd rather do in a music climate than be in a studio for 10, 12, 15 hours a day. It was just, it was great. And I was, you know, for that, for, for that project, I think we were in the studio for maybe five months straight of just making music. It was unbelievable. And, you know, we were in there from, I think, January, February of 1994, you know, up into June. And it was just great. It was awesome. So it was a great experience. Yes, there were bad things about it, but they were minimal compared to it. I mean, the other thing was that when they finally pulled the plug on us, that December of 1995, we saw it coming. And I think we needed a break anyway, because it's just, you know, if you, you know how it is, Brian. Things get really intense. And bands, especially when you think it's going to be your career, yeah. and you put everything into it, and when that starts to slow down, and you sort of see another reality come into it, you know, we were all in our late twenties, so you know, it's just like it was like we don't, we don't have any control of this anymore. I wanted to keep going, but the other some of the other guys wanted to take a break and just get sort of steady your sense of financial stability, right? Yeah. You know, I don't blame them. So, I mean, that's it in a nutshell. I could go into tons of stories about it. But I think it echoes probably what you went through as well. Now, in, in 92 and 93, I mean, we were doing all this. You know, you're under a record contract and you're supposed to be making another album. But everybody's working a full-time job in a factory or something. So you're working 50-hour weeks. Yeah. And then you're, you're, you know, creating this music and you're in the rehearsal hall till midnight. And then, you know, two years, 18 months going by and every single song is rejected by the by the label because they're saying that everything is just too much progressive rock. And it's like, well, what kind of a band do you think we are? You think we're going to write something like Aerosmith or something? I mean, yeah, we, we didn't have that. They, they loved our music. I mean, Michael Kaplan was our A&R guy and he, he signed us for what we were. I mean, he just was like, he was a big, huge fan of what we were doing. Was really impressed by what we were doing as far as at a grassroots level, the amount of people that we had coming to our shows. We were selling out shows in Philadelphia. We were selling out shows in um, Quebec and stuff like that, too. And um, he was excited by it. So we had no problems like that. That was definitely, that was a little bit different. Like everything that we gave them, there was never any scrutiny about like, hey, can you give us a, 
a three and a half minute song or whatever. They didn't care. As long as right. we were happy, they loved it. So that, that was a, a joyous experience as well, that for that, you know? Wow. Um, so, uh, Ryan. So I was uh, wondering, since I know you're a guitarist as well, like what are, you know, your guitar influences, you know, who made you want to start playing the guitar and like what keeps you inspired right now? Oh, that's a good question. Um, well, first off, I think I would say that uh, it's not like the guitar isn't one of those things that inspires me. I think music in general, right? I mean, I've, mm-hmm, I've me been, too. yeah, I've been musical since I was my earliest memories of just, you know, like I said before in interviews, just sort of reaching up and playing notes on a piano above my head as a little kid. And it wasn't banging. You know, it's just like I, I, I get obsessed with like intervals and then how the, the notes are blending together and things like that. So playing, I mean, I've always been musical. I've loved music. I used to sit and just stare at, stare at an LP going around and just listening to all kinds of things. When I picked up the guitar, I think there was just some turbulence in my house. And as a teen, I just wanted to find something that I could get into and just pick that up. Now, I, I was into a lot of different kinds of bands, but it wasn't really, like I said, it wasn't about the guitar. It was just more about the songs and how they interested me. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's probably the same. I mean, I, I went through, like, my guitar studies went through everything from, you know, Beatles stuff to learning, like, easy stuff, like, say, Black Sabbath, like Tony Iommi, to getting into Led Zeppelin stuff where it's like, oh, that's, you can actually tune the guitar in different ways and you don't have to play this stuff and just moving on. I, I think when I was probably 15, you know, maybe like you guys where I just went into a Rush craze and learned all the early Rush albums and then went into yeah. Dave, Dave Gilmore and I'm like, oh, these are cool. You can bend the notes to these cool things. So, but I have to say, it's always about the songs. It wasn't never, I was never like a gunslinger guy where I, you know, was trying to learn guitar. Like I, like watching people like Derek Trucks play slide, I'm like, that's one of the most beautiful things in the world, but I'm more of a song guy. So um, I love that. But to me, like if if he's playing songs that are are bad and he's playing it brilliantly, like it's just, that's a, it's not as cool as being a great songwriter and playing great guitar. I I hope that answers your question. I love listening to guitar players. Like, I listen to just, like, songwriters. I love that. But I also, you're right in the sense where, like, I, I listen to some guitar. I love listening to guitar. I don't know if it's the same way with you, where I don't know what they're playing. Where I'm like, oh, I never, that, that interval or that way of playing that. Um, I remember when I was younger, I actually got a chance a couple of years ago to be on the same stage with, like, somebody like Steve Hackett, where I remember as a kid learning, like, the Coo Cocoon. And... Um, he started playing it. I was there with a guy named Francis Dunnery. And, and uh, he's like, this is how you play it. I was like, oh, man, that's a, that's a mind blowing. That's the fingering. You know what I mean? Wow. I, I love that kind of stuff, you know? Wow. Um, yeah. Thiago. Yes. Um, so my question is also based on guitar, but it's in a different way. Um, usually, like, in the 60s, 70s, Prague, the the main lead used to be like you know the keys the hammer the mellotron things like this and guitars would guitars would do some leads but would just accompany the keys right and with that said in the future now it's usually more guitars like nowadays right in a, in a progressive rock band and keys kind of took like a background and so um, my question is how do you find a perfect balance in your band for the keys and the guitar to not to overshadow one another if that's such a thing yeah that's a good question well it's First off, if we're talking about what we're using in the recording process or how you're structuring a song, it's, it's always about the song, Thiago. It's never about an instrument. It's right. always about making sure that you can convey a certain emotion. I mean, this took me years to figure this out. I mean, my 20s, I didn't know that. It took, it took like mid-30s where I'm like, oh, wait a second. I actually don't need to do that. I can let that person do that instead. So... It's always about the song, um, but it's, but in a sonic sense as well, you know, thinking about how that, that instrument, the tonality, the timbre, the octave range that you're playing in, different inversions, that's yeah. huge in production. Like, if I'm going to play a C chord and say Chris and Eklund's going to play a C chord, well, if we do the same one, that has a certain sound to it, in meaning interval-wise and, and octave uh, pitch-wise. But if you change it up, 
that that does something else. So being aware of that is part of that answering your question as far as like how you find right. space for those things. And um, it happens all the time. Like sometimes Chris will be playing keys, and I'm like, don't don't play the octaves with your left hand, or don't even play a left hand. That's being covered already. So or like, hey, can you just raise that inversion up and just do that? And he's he's great. Like he and I are to- totally about that. Nice. I'll say this too. Like I'm, when I was younger, playing a lot. Like those early Echolin records, I don't even remember what I was playing because the whole point of it was trying to play things that I'd never played before. So right. I'm playing these chord changes that I don't even know what they are. I'm just memorizing shapes. So right. that's, that's, it's funny because I've listened to other sort of guitar players, like I said, Elliot Smith and stuff, but he's the same way I am. He's just looking at shapes and memorizing those and that those shapes become the, the bed of what how the song is memorized in my head you know so that's mm-hmm. another way i think about it and I, chris is a little bit like that too he's more theory oriented in my than echoing but um you know we, we try to make the shapes work together so nice. and then obviously you get really specific dude you can get into eq then when you're mixing and just carving out space for things you know that kind of mm-hmm. thing so i don't know if you do that as well when you're writing but that's what i do yeah Makes sense. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, I I guess it's my turn again because um. I mean, oh. another another thing I wanted to add is like it's not oh. it's not an ego thing at all. Like I know a lot of times with I te- technical stuff, like everyone's trying to you know do the most that they can as if they're gonna die tomorrow. But I, I don't. Oh yeah. I just want to write a good song, and that to me that's the hardest yeah. thing in the world. Usually, usually, uh, yeah. usually when I write when when I write my stuff. Right, and if uh, I'm gonna think of uh, any instrumental section or write a piece like that, I'm always yeah. trying to think of the other instruments. Like I cannot just be guitar solo, guitar solo. I'm not exactly. so much into guitar solo. Yeah. I'm not so much into guitar solos anymore. I'm into like unisons, harmonies between the keys, the the yeah. guitars, the drum counterpoint. uh, you know, counterpoints, you name it. Oh, a guitar cool. solo might come here and there, but if I don't do a guitar solo, I also want to give the space to the key player. I want to give the space somebody. You know, in not every song needs a solo too. It doesn't. Yeah. There are bands that do that and it gets, it gets really old. Yeah. yeah. It's really old the, yeah, Thiago, you brought up a good point about being aware of um uh when you double melodies and things like that. There's a, like you find you find out like what who's the one that you want to talk the most right. in a song. And if it happens to be a certain melody, whether a voice is covering it or or an instrument. You know, it's cool to like double that with different timbres to really bring that out. Yeah. And then everything else is like the Greek chorus under it. And everything just has to support that. And also, um, it's like staging, like I said, in a Greek chorus, like how the harmonic value is counts underneath that melody is where the emotion comes from. Because that's where you can throw things. And just that's being true. aware of that. And like you said, doubling a melody is, is a huge part of that as well as well as the harmonic value underneath so those are huge yeah absolutely exactly yeah. so it it sounds to me uh brett that uh, the relationship between you and other band members are is very very uh cozy and you're not uh, there's not any yeah. ego clashing no we awesome. we uh we got we've never been ego i mean we we had you know everybody has it but we went through all the arguments and ego related stuff when we were younger and we split up in or just took a break i'll say in 95 um we we all grew a lot because we finally got to go out and play with other people in those years between i mean even 1987 up to 1995 i was saying no all the time working with other people people were like hey can you you want to do this and i was like no i'm, I'm in my band i gotta do that but yeah. After that, I started working with other people, and that just opened the door to learning, which is huge. And I, I was like, "What the hell have I been doing? I've been wasting, you know, so much time saying no instead of just saying yes." And you know, the other thing is too, you grow um, and immature as you get older, and you just it's like, I, here's the thing: like with our band, it's like I just we're all like great friends. We love to hang out. We're all we've been through so much together. Uh, you know, in a positive and negative way. It's just, it's a beautiful thing. Like it's, I, when I go down to Chris, like if Ray and I go down to Chris's place or he comes up this way, it's, 
it's it's just the music is so joyous and easy. It's just unbelievable. Right. Beautiful. Right. So that's the most important thing. It's it's like a hobby that I have that that allows me to relieve stress and just hang out with my friends that I love. Very right. true. Right. That yeah, that makes some um, perfect sense. So um, I'll um, I'll take the I'll say my next question. I had to think about it because you already <laughs> answered my second question, which was uh, which album was more most enjoyable for you to record and write and stuff. Um, so I know that uh, the well, band. I'll, I'll, I'll say this: Who's talking, Ryan? Are you, are you talking? Uh, no, was, uh, yeah, me. Oh, oh, sorry. Yeah, I mean. I'll say this, as far as like, if you asked about recording, I mean, those ones that I mentioned were sort of joyous and easy, but I, mm-hmm. I liked the process of recording all of the records. I mean, as the world was different from Cowboy Poems and like, yeah, of one course. of the things that we do is that every time we get together, there has to be a different impetus and uh, sort of like schematic for how we're going to record because if that's not the case, we're all going to get bored really fast. So there has to be yeah. some sort of a new thing that's going to happen there. And that new thing is what adds joy and fun to the project. So mm-hmm. that's what it takes so long for us to put out albums because we, you have to find that thing that's going to light the fire. It's got to be a, a strong catalyst for you. Yeah. And if we don't have it, what we're doing is we're just almost like painting by numbers at that point. We can get right. together and write a song in a day and record it and put it out. Yeah. But if it doesn't, have like an energy to it as far as like a newness to it, then I'm, I'm not doing it. And I know the right. other guys feel the same. Right. Um, so actually, I, I, my uh, my new second question, which by the way, great answer for uh, what you what I was going to ask, but you know, um, my question was actually going is now um, when it came down to Echo Lynn in 1996. You guys put out um, when the Sa- when the sweet turned sour, which, by the way, some great material and really well done, really well done recording stuff. Uh, good songs. Um, I noticed that you guys took about a four year period afterwards, and then you guys released Cowboy Poems Free, which, by the way, is my favorite. Um, oh, wow. What do you find was the the spark that ignited Echo Lynn to record Cowboy Poems Free. Yeah, um, the joy of hanging out together again. That's all it is. That's all it was. We just missed each other. That album that you're talking about, Sweet Turn Sour, I mean, none of us really consider it an album. That was a bailout situation yeah. for us. You know, it's just like we took things that we had that we never did anything with mm-hmm. that we were sort of in the middle of, or in the middle of working on, and we just... I think it was Cyclops Records offered us some money to to just put that out. And we were in debt, a lot of money. So they just, I think they gave us like five grand. We just paid off our bills and um, just got got out of it, you know. But that's, it's a weird collection of songs, but I like that it's out there. You know, it just has some sort of miss, you know, things that never sort of got put out. So the same thing with the box set. It had a bunch of that sort of stuff and other things as well. Those are yeah. sort of collection albums, you know what I mean? Those, those kind of things. So, mm-hmm. but Cowboy Cowboy Poems was just us just missing each other and getting back and trying new things again. It's great, right? And um, awesome. there is a lot of really strong material on on uh, both projects. <laughs> I mean, Another Day is uh, is one of my favorites. Um, however, I think my probably my favorite song off. Uh, off Cowboy Poems has to be um, probably Texas Dust, the the opener. It's a it's a banger from 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 uh, from uh, an opener point of view, and yeah. it just it hits you in the face. It's like a punch in the gut, and it it's really strong. It's it's a it's a great opener for a really great album. So, Dad, thank you. All right, so I you know I'm, I'm thinking back to. Uh, because uh, you and I are basically the same age, you know. I started high school in 1979, and mm-hmm. you know, the Wall was the biggest album on the planet. Yeah. And <laughs> there was a, there was a lot of uh, prog bands that were, you know, or prog related that were able to sell a lot of albums. You know, you had Alan Parsons was big then, and Super Tramp had Breakfast in America. Oh and, my gosh, one of my favorites! Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Rock had. Uh, um, I guess uh, permanent waves and moving pictures. Oh, so great album. I love that. Yeah. 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 So you, you 
And then on, at, on top of that, you know, if it's 1980 and you're 15 and you're buying Trick of the Tail, it's not that long ago. It wasn't even five years ago. <laughs> yeah, true. Now it seems like it's, you know, well, it is a long time ago. But, <laughs> and, you know, yeah. again, a lot of really big bands that were playing progressive rock music or progressive related music. And so you got the idea in your head that uh, as you were getting, you know, 15, 16, 17, 18, and then you see the second generation with uh, Yes coming back with 90125 and selling, I don't know, eight or 10 million. And Rush was still selling tons of albums, even in the middle, middle eighties. They really thought that being a progressive rock musician could be something where you could get into the industry and you could make, you know, you could make a living and you'd, you'd have audiences and people would like this kind of a thing. And um, the eighties music, I mean, there was other things that came in, in the eighties, other genres or whatever, but lots of them still seem to be not that far removed from things that were in the seventies. So you didn't really get the idea that you were going to be, you know, hitting the nineties and it was going to be like rap and uh, um, grunge. Grunge. That kind of a thing. You just couldn't, I don't know. I didn't foresee it. And I, t I tell uh, you a very interesting story, which is that our album on the major label in 1991 came out in September. And that was the exact same day, I think, basically, that that uh, Nirvana album came out. Yeah. And uh, basically, uh, you know, bands with keyboards were like, and we were mostly keyboard oriented, more than <laughs> guitar oriented. And, you know, you were just like now from being something that you thought was in flavor to being the thing that was the most out of flavor yeah. right yeah, that, and that's why probably the record company put so much pressure on us to try and do something commercial and more like a rock band because they just couldn't sell that stuff anymore mm -hmm. um, did, you guys, did, you guys, did you guys have guitar as well in the band yeah we uh, by the time we were doing the album we had uh, we were a four piece so the the lead singer was our guitar player and so he didn't mind because he had to sing he didn't mind sometimes just letting me have more space so there was there's there's guitar on almost every song but it's not as prominent as the keyboards and that that's kind of what more of what i'm trying to say yeah. um so you know i'm just wondering if you know how you feel about the the massive changes that have taken place in you know the way that what's perceived as being reasonable music and what kind of audiences you're actually going to attract and you know that feeling in the 90s especially is that it's not so much anymore, I don't think. But in the '90s, people really thought that anything that, you know, it sounded like '70s Genesis was like the most hated, right? <laughs> yeah, I have a. It's weird. I have a uh, another point of view on that because I've thought about this a lot myself over my life, and um, it's obviously it's, it's age cohort related in a sense, like coming of age, um, and also in your formative years, how that's influencing like for you and i we're getting influenced by you know late 60s music and 70s music when we're kids young early 70s and then we start coming of age you know in the late 70s and 80s and that music is influencing me um so that never goes away with age like that's always the way that it is and it's funny now like in my, with my students i talk to them and they talk about vinyl and all that kind of stuff. I'm like, yeah, I mean, how old are your parents? You know, do they have vinyl? Like, oh yeah, we saw the vinyl and you know, we're into it. You know what I mean? And so they, they have that little slice of something that they see what that is. And it's it's back, it's big again, you know? It's just running that course of nostalgia and stuff like that. And that'll diminish over time. You know, it'll just get less and less because obviously that platform is, technologically speaking, it's just diminishing more and more. But that's another right. whole conversation itself. But Anyway, I, I always think of the 80s, I don't know if you do as well, but it's like sort of technology kicked in, you know, with automation on consoles in the late 70s, also digital things like digital reverbs instead of natural reverbs. You had sampling for the first time where you can sample snare drums or any other sound and apply it to a song. You have click tracks and locking with synthy time code for the first time in music. All this stuff became evident. You have things like the Synclavier, coming in and you have the, uh, the Fairlight coming in in the 80s and the late 70s. And all these things are infiltrating things. And for me, the 80s started to feel like it was getting, um, the songs were sort of taking a second tier to the technology. And um, it was like, I just wanted to hear like a cool song without all the samples and stuff. Cause 
you know, it's funny, like a lot of those guys from the 80s, when you hear them go out, they have an acoustic guitar and playing it now. It's like, oh, there's the song. You know, it's like, you yeah. got these big snare drums and stuff like that. And I always, as a, I've learned that as a producer to find that real thing. And the 80s was one of those moments that it sort of stepped on the, the songs. It's funny because the 80s have come back again because those kids that are born in the 80s, you know, now they're in offices and they want to listen to, you know, B101 or stations that play 80s all the time. You know what I mean? Yeah. For me, I was like, not 80s. You know, it, it was kind of disturbing. Mm-hmm. But back to the 90s, because I just want to, I'll just give you my point of view on that. In the 80s, I was listening to 70s music. I'm playing in bands. I'm playing like Who songs and Pink Floyd and Super Tramp songs in the 80s. And, and people that were like, wow, you guys are cool. You play classic rock. And I'm 17 years old. Why aren't you playing the latest Bon Jovi hit, Bad Medicine? And I'm like, I don't want to, I don't get that. That's not, that's not how I grew up with that stuff. Um, so how come you're not wearing leather and all that? I was wearing flannel in the 80s in, in high school and junior high. So then it's funny because then in the 90s, all of a sudden, all that technology sort of went away. Guitars got big again. They weren't processed with all that digital reverb and all the, the rock men and jazz chorus and all that kind of stuff. They weren't thin. They got big again, like the 70s and the 60s, recording-wise speaking. Mm-hmm. And I immediately was like, oh, my gosh, this is great. Like, I got to tell you, the first time I heard – spirit i was floating in a pool and i was like holy shit this is amazing like it was like i was like the recording just got good again and like all those people that came in from sound garden to james addiction to allison chains like i'm right in there because when we were playing those bands were they were in the club in front of us playing we're like who's that who's that guy jeff buckley that's there and we would come into the club and like, oh my gosh you should have seen this guy and i was like you know, I'm like, who are these people? And like, that's my generation. So I get that identify with it, right or wrong. Like, I like that. I love how guitars, real sounding drums, all the samples went away. Like nobody's cutting new empty time code or click tracks anymore. And it was really cool. So I identified that. Now that didn't last long because what happened was digital recording came out again. Uh, and it's sort of like people started getting into manipulation. And then it was like, a second wave of that stuff, but it's just interesting how people look at that stuff. You know, I, I, I love talking about that. So you thought, Brian, you actually thought that it was a, more of a negative thing. So you got, you got, you probably weren't like a Nirvana or a Smashing Pumpkins fan or anything like that. Like, I love the keyboard. Did you notice like Mellotron came back again? Like you heard that on Soundgarden, Smashing Pumpkins. Like I'm like Jellyfish. I'm like, there's a Mellotron. Awesome. Jellyfish, great band. Yeah. You never heard that stuff in the 80s. Like, it went away in the 80s. Unless you were sure. someone like yourself that, you know, like, I, I, I'm i not a keyboard player. I love playing piano. I have a Rose and a Wurlitzer right way on the road because I grew up with those sounds and I use them on my recordings. But nobody was doing that in the 80s. That stuff came back in the 90s. And now it's obviously leveled off. But you, it's funny. You see it on videos these days. Like, My Morning Jacket just put out an album. Um a couple of weeks ago, be, actually beginning of July. And it's like, oh, he's playing a whirly, you know? He's, oh, look at that. He's playing a pedal steel through a jazz chorus, you know? It's like, it's cool. It's so cool. I love that. It's great. Yeah, so, I, you know, my my recollection is that when we were doing the first album that didn't get released, um, you, you know, that idea of, you know, putting the keyboard part and then they're going to quantize it and all that stuff. And yeah. that, was, that was the way that, that producer on that album was saying, that's what a modern keyboard player does. And I'm drink. I was dragging in my 1947 B3 and, <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and telling them that, you know, I also, I see that there's a grand piano out there. I want to go play that. And they're like, you're like, you're 12 years for 15 years out of date. So, uh, you know, and I think, um, you know, not, not that I have anything against some of the, music that came up uh, in the 90s or anything. I just don't think it, it, it attracted me very much. I started getting into much more um, jazz fusion and, you know, stuff like that. And I still I still love, uh, like, 70s soft rock, like America and Crosby Stills. Oh, Absolutely, yeah. So it, it just yeah. that was, just wasn't my flavor. But when, I, when we reformed uh, Benjamin's Kite in 2017, and it's hard to say we really reformed, although we have released an album, but really, it's just a recording project, and we're not touring. We're not trying to get a record deal or anything. Can I add? Uh, 
might I add something to that conversation? Become like I'm the between because you guys mm-hmm. are in your 60s, I'm 35, and the boys are like 17. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. I'm in my 50s, my young 50s. <laughs> okay. Wow, the youngest is okay. Shots fired. <laughs> hey, listen, I'm getting close to 40, bro. So I gotta, you know, age us other people too, you know, to make me feel a little more secure. <laughs> okay, so I grew, I grew up in that time, like, you no know, uh, mid 80s and 90s, right? That's why the grunge came in. And like you said, that a lot of people are abandoning the whole digital stuff that, you know, glam rock use and all the stuff, you know, synth pop. Um, mm-hmm. Compositional wise, I didn't mind. But like you said, the recording, the the, the sampling, it got a, lo- a little bit overboard. And uh, I think this is the yeah. one of the reasons why a lot of those bands were doing Unplugged, right? Nirvana was doing Unplugged. Some type of pilots were doing Unplugged because people got interested. Whether you like the genre or not, whether you like, ah, it's not my thing. Like, personally, it wasn't my thing either. I like a select few. Nirvana, not my thing. But I could understand why people were like, I want to watch an unplugged acoustic version of, like, no, this song. It was real. That was that. Yeah, it was real. Like, you could definitely no, see if this guy played a song and not just on the studio where every, you know, you could edit that out. Whatever mistake. Um... So I think, like like you said, at, at the advent of like the year 2000, that's when the digital stuff started coming back again, yeah. where you heard a lot of like, you know, techno making a resurgence, trance music, whatever. Um, nowadays, uh, what I'm going to observe for my generation is that either they got stuck in the past or the 90s stuff, like where they still like, you know, like I was talking to Ryan earlier today, we binge listen to Metallica, where I can't personally anymore because it's overly, too overly sort of, too overproduced for me. Yeah. Uh, not too organic at all. Whereas I'm always stuck in between the 70s era to the 90s, like Dream Theater, but the more obscure stuff, to nowadays, I don't know if you ever heard bands of like Caligula's Horse, uh, IQ, uh, Haken. I don't know if you ever heard about those bands. So, IQ I've heard of, yeah. Right. Ah, yes, so, thank you. Grow, growing up in the 90s, it's kind of like guys your age, like my uncles and stuff, would always be listening to Big Floyd, Prog, Jazz Fusion, Chick Corea. And yeah. my brother and my brothers and my cousins would be like listening to like you know, Aerosmith, Nirvana, U2, Bon Jovi. <laughs> and while, while I was a kid, you kind of like it in the beginning. Yeah. Eventually, when I reached my teenage, I was growing out of it. I started listening to Iron Maiden. I started listening to... Uh, uh, you know, dream theater, stuff like that. So yeah. I kind of see both ways, like what Brian is coming around, where he doesn't really get to the genre, where you said it's great, where the recording, you know, went back being organic a little bit more, you know, and hopefully yeah. it stays that way. I think Man, also, it's... I mean, from a music standpoint too, I mean, if you um, if you listen to some of those Nirvana song guys, like some of those key changes that are going on, like a song like Lithium, I mean, listen to it, dude. That's that's Claude Debussy. Like those changes, like nobody. That's Beatles stuff. That's like beautiful key changes in that in that thing. That's like that's a pretty awesome thing. Like you're not getting that stuff, you know, in the '80s. I mean, there are people like maybe uh, Elvis Costello. Probably Tears for Fears had some great stuff too. But yeah, like that's cool stuff to me. I mean, like that. Like I said, that's what I listen to. I'm not listening to the instruments. I'm just more I mean, other than a recording point of view. But I love. Like great songs right. and cool changes where I'm like mm-hmm. that's the thing when I heard Teen Spirit, I'm like, what is what's going on with like it was that's shifting keys right off the bat of that rip, which is great. And having a melody on top of those changes that is that catchy is a difficult thing to do. It's not right. Easy, right. You know? So um I was gonna interject Ryan. for one one thing. Um so did you ever feel that prod was uh resurfacing at all in the nineties? At all. Like well, was that a was that a thing that was going on or no or no no I never did because I um you're saying for the nineties right yeah the nineties two thousands like did, was there ever a sense of that because there were a lot of underground bands for sure no because what yeah I think there were I mean we didn't know about it when we started playing um, it was more about just like classic rock and just trying to like see what kind of things we were doing like Chris was he was going to school for music comp so. He's bringing in like atonal stuff like Schoenberg and Stravinsky. I'm listening right. to other things and bringing those influences in. So we were in a bit of a bubble. And then the, the weird thing, well, not weird, but the cool thing that happened was that yeah. these prog guys that were older than us were like, you guys are awesome. Can you come to our city and, and play? And we used to drive there. And 
you know, the venues would be packed full of people that were into this. And I always felt more akin to, like I said earlier, like the people that were playing that were our age, like we, we were listening, like I said, Nirvana, Jeff Buckley, Allison Chase, like that was, to me, like that was the energy that we had. Like if you listen, we have a song called The Chief Stands Alone. There's a harmony in there that's a little nod to, you know, Alice in Chains, because that was like, nice. like what we were thinking in there. I mean, so the prog people, when they started bo- listening to it, it was, it was great because it's how, you can't, how great is adulation, right? It's unbelievable. Mm-hmm. So, um, but we never, we never felt compelled to then play to that market. We always just, we always thought of ourselves, to be honest with you, as a, as a rock band, like a punk kind of a rock, like lots of energy. And then right when we got tired of that, we would do like an acoustic thing, an album of like little songs like that, just to change it up, that sort of a thing. Um, uh, right. It's, it's, you know, it's just, it's interesting. Like, I do I know there was a resurgence in the 90s? When it came about later, like with bands like Spock Beard and stuff like that, I was like, oh, they're, they're doing what we already did. And I was already on to other things. You know what I mean? Right. I remember that. Bit. Um. Yeah. Um, so, Ryan, uh, why don't you get your second question in? Yeah, my, my second question was like, what is the, you know, the recording and the, the writing process look like for Echo Lynn? Oh, That's a good question. Um, it's mostly uh, Chris, Ray, and I. Um, mm-hmm. Chris or I will have like a, an idea and, um, or, or Ray in a left sense musical. And, and then Chris, uh, Ray and I are the word people. So we'll have the lyrics and, we just get together and like this new album that we're doing, it's the three of us just working on stuff. I have an electric guitar, Chris is sitting at the piano and we're just writing, you know, all that idea. And then we write the song. We just keep building around the idea. So it's very communal. It's a group, true band effort. I want to stress that it's a band effort because if, why would you want to be in a band if you're going to be telling people what to play? I mean, I have solo albums. I can you know what I mean? <laughs> right. I want to use yeah. I want to use the other guys in the band to make something new out of it. So it's, right. it's we definitely do that. So it's collaborative by by all means. Yeah, um, that makes a lot of sense. Also, um, I am very curious about this new release. Um, I was actually going to, um, at the very beginning of the episode, ask you what you think that this new album will sound like, but. If you don't want to delve into that too much, because I know that you're gonna, you're probably going to want to do an announcement on that eventually on a, on your YouTube channel or on the Echolin channel or something along those lines. But if you do I want to talk I'd about it, for sure. yeah. I mean, do you have any specific questions? I'd be glad. I'm not. Yeah, there's nothing. I'd be glad to talk about it. all transparency. Oh, sure. Maybe, maybe, maybe could, maybe could be related to my question in my last one. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Because my, my next question would be, if there was any sounds or genres or ambiance that you didn't, you guys didn't incorporate so far into your band that now you want to explore, and oh, maybe in the new yeah, album. Yeah, for sure. Great question. Yeah, that's a good question. And you, that is something that we, we try to do on every album, put some sort of a new thing into it. The 2012 album had strings on it, which we hadn't done for a while. And um, uh, that was yeah. a quartet. So we used a quartet mm-hmm. in that um, two violins, viola, and cello, and yeah. wow. that was new. On this album, I'd love to maybe try to get some warm brass. Like we used brass on an album called "The End Is Beautiful." That was more sort of like your classic sort of uh, "Let's Sweat and Tear Chicago" kind of a thing, where you've got yeah uh, sax, trumpet, trombone, kind of a thing. But oh yeah, that's what I would like to do. I would like to do more of like a warmer horns like an English horn, French horn, and like create beds of chords around that. Yeah. I think that would be really cool. I've yeah. never done that. And there's some stuff maybe with some strings or I, I'd love to get like some like a, a cool ensemble of like of singers, like female singers. And like I love 60s music where you have these great background singers singing these things. Like I think that's so cool. Not like Broadway, but just like really soulful and, and beautiful and just yeah. Adding, like, first time yes. back, like I love that, you know, like that guy. Some form of Vacatala. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. You know? So, and then the other thing I'll say, uh, you know, just to shed light, I mean, like I said, this album is the first time where um, it's just Chris Ray and I just working on it. So it's very, um, there's a lot of space because it's piano, guitar, 
and and we're just doing like base race playing bass on it. So it's there's a lot of really simple but really really deep harmonically. So there's something like that. Whereas the past two albums, there's a there's a there's a heaviness to them. This one there's yeah, a heaviness, sure. but there's a bit more. Bass on it. Yeah, that's what I noticed when I listened to the last two. There is a bit of a more of a... Um, it's a little bit rougher on the edges when it comes down to, you know, heavier guitar tones. Which, by the way, I yeah. thought that that was a really cool incorporation of uh, new guitar tones, which, great job on that. Um, Thank you. What I noticed I is that... Yeah. Um, I noticed that when it came down to the sound of your earlier works, which would be like... And I'm like, as the world, which has very more, those harmonies are beyond Gentle Giant. I mean, holy crap. I don't think you could get yep. more uh, Gentle Giant there if you tried, which, by the way, love that. Love the harmonies that you and Ray did. Um, were you planning on incorporating that kind of stuff into the uh, the new one, too? Yeah, I'd love to. Um, that's like another whole stage that, that we can get into. And that would include bringing. Chris into it as well, the three of us. Because if you listen to As a Little Bit, the three of us on those. And, yeah. um, you know, we were definitely on that album because we had never done it, like pushing ourselves to see what you could do with contrapuntal stuff with voice and instrumentation. And yeah, I mean, that's about as far as I want to go in that world. There's a lot of atonal stuff. I mean, there's a song called The Wiblet on there that's just oh. a series of 12 tone rows. Oh, yeah. And it's just, and also contrapuntal rhythmic stuff. So it's just can't, now that's not random. Like that's all planned out, and that's Chris and I working out mm -hmm. those rows and figuring all that stuff out. So that's about as far out as I want to go because it starts getting into a little bit like it's like it's like ah, look at us, see what we're doing here, and like I don't want it to ever be like that. I, I feel like I just always right. want it to be about saying something. Like, it can be instrumental too. That's fine, but. Right. Saying something where it's just like, look at me do all this stuff. It just gets a little, I've done that and I don't want to do it anymore. Can we touch that. on it on the new stuff? Yeah, because I, I do, I love background vocals. Oh, I yeah. love lead vocals and Ray, Ray and I sculpting that stuff and Chris. Um, it's, it's like, I think it gives us a little bit of a unique quality. You, know? you yeah, should, you sure. should check out, you should check out my man Ryan new song then because Ryan is coming up some great stuff where the back vocals, yeah. I can tell those harmonies. Can you, uh, I mean, if you want to send me, I'd love to hear it, seriously. Or, or point me to a, into a link or something. I'm, I'm always going to check this stuff out. Yeah. Sure. Um, I, yeah. I really appreciate that. Yeah, the, yeah. I think that that would be a great idea. Um, uh, I don't know Please. if you, I don't know if you heard uh, Conquering in Steel, though. I mean, uh, if you did, uh -huh. well, uh, my dad, dad was like, you got to send it to him. I was like, okay, if, if, if you think it would be a good idea. I'd love to hear it. I, I, like I, dude, I I listen to so much music. I've never mm -hmm. gotten. I have. Right. If, if we weren't talking right now, I'd have music on. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> yeah, that's me and me, me and my Stay dad here. to the max. Yeah, all of us. Oh, that's so cool. That's that's really cool. That you and your dad kind of do that. Like in my house, man. Like growing up, I was the like my house is full of like a bunch of jocks. I'm mm, like yeah. the, I'm like an anomaly. You know what I mean? My dad was like <laughs> making me play sports. I was like, I don't want to play sports. I just want to play music. Yeah, I don't want to play sports. So that's yeah. really cool. I'm, I'm sort of jealous of you guys. Uh, you know, my, my, <laughs> my, my, house, my household, like, growing up was kind of a little bit half and half. Like, my dad, he was into sports, but he loved music. Like, he had a very, like, bassy voice. Like, if he, like, learned, if he was coached, he could be, like, singing like Elvis. Like, he had that voice, right? Oh, cool. My mom's yeah. side is where mostly of the musical people in my family are. My uncles play piano, guitar playing in bands, listening to Pink Floyd, Chikoria, Pat Metheny, yeah. all that kind of stuff, right? Yeah. On my dad's, like, usually well, my cousins, some of my cousins on my dad's side started learning, like, how to play music. So it was kind of halfway, like, where I got a lot of physical activity. I was pushed to do, like, martial arts. Even though I was, like, a nerdy kid growing up, I was, like, you know, very, like, uh, a scaredy cat. But then I grew up to, like, you know, be a little more confident. But I always had that musical side in my family where I never let that go. And that became oh, it was always a huge part. Like everything I listen to, if I'm playing a video game, if I'm watching a movie, I'm paying attention to the score, the music. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Do, you, do you sing? <laughs> Tiago, do you also sing or what? Uh, no. <laughs> I wish. I could be formed when I was like probably in like my early 20s. But right now, I don't think I could try to learn. But <laughs> yeah. Dude, it's just, a it's just a muscle. And then also... 
I mean, you're probably not tone deaf if you're a musician, so you got that working for you. And then the other thing right. is, this is, why, is, this is why I don't even attempt to sing, because I'm not tone deaf. <laughs> yeah, uh, we, it's just about being confident and being yourself. I, sure. I work with singers yeah. all the time, and it's it's just like if you just put out a personality, an honest personality, you can get away with murder. Like, it's, it's I love that, you know? <laughs> yeah. You, right. Like, don't try to sound like somebody else. Just be yourself, and that's a beautiful that's thing. That's true. Perfect. Exactly. That's, oh, that's, right. that's a, I think that's a pretty good, uh, Note to end on that subject. So um, let's get into the first big subject, or well, basically the last, the the real big subject, which is the progressive rock scene in the U.S. Um, uh, Brett, would you uh, like to uh, start us off with that subject? Well, uh, <laughs> you guys are going to kill me because I actually I'm not I don't pay attention to it other than through my friends that are really yeah. into it, like Chad yeah. Hutchinson and those guys, you know, the, the near fest guys, they, they're into it. So whenever I go over and hang out with them, like that's when I get to hear all that stuff. Yeah. Other right. than, other than, um, you know, like, uh, people that are supportive of my music sending me songs, I get to hear it that way. But I, I'm, I honestly am not plugged into it. It's weird because I do listen to, like I said, a ton of music, but I'm more of like a yeah. singer songwriter, guy so i i tend to do that um i'm trying to think of this there are some cool stuff like um chris turned me on to this band called umfell uh there's a album called as the waters cover the sea that is a pretty cool progressive album uh it's like guitar but it's also keys and it's it's really cool now i don't think they're part of the progressive community i think they're just they're just doing their thing um right there's right. a lot of interesting bands like that i think they're separate from that, like I said, I mean, I I just bought the new Rufus Wainwright album. It's called um, Unfollow the Rules. I mean, to me, that's like a progressive album because it's like using these new harmonies that he's never done. He's trying new things, and like when I listen to it, I'm like, oh my gosh, this is so great! I, I love the changes right. and all that sort of stuff. Um, Pat sure. Metheny's new album, dude, from this oh, place from is this place is beyond amazing. gorgeous, beyond gorgeous. It's I mean, amazing. it's just yeah. absolutely beautiful. You know? Yeah. I mean, even pe even people like this, you're gonna laugh at this, but I mean, I, I don't listen to um, much uh, hip hop or rap because it's just not my generation. I didn't grow up in it, even though my right. younger brother does. But I, this early January, uh, I was listening to an interview with a, a great producer and musician, uh, John Bryan, who does he's wrote scores for like Magnolia, I Love Hard Huckabees, uh, Lady Bird. So he's one of the great. He was in. He he was a session guy for the Jellyfish stuff, as well as countless other oh, wow. albums but um anyway he produced posthumously um the last elliot smith from 2003 and also this guy mac miller who's dead now too oh um, yes i mean dude that album it's called circles it's so beautiful and it's 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 like it's the textures and stuff like that are just i like i love that it's great and that it's funny like a lot of my friends that are into hip-hop and stuff it's like my way to shake hands with them because I'm like, oh, this has all that element and then it's got sort of the stuff that I really get drawn into. And to me, that's a like hugely fusion progressive-y kind of thing to do. So, yeah. right. like, that's where, that's where I come from with it. Now, to me, to be speaking, um, I'm not going to, I won't say like pejoratively, but a little bit more like a lot of the prog stuff I hear is sort of the same thing that I've heard a million <laughs> times and it doesn't feel progressive to me now i'll say this too with that in mind a lot of people come to progressive music in their late teens and early 20s so i have to give a break to those dudes and women because they're they're getting into it for the first time just like i did like i went through my elp yes phase all that stuff gentle giant all that kind of stuff yeah i mean out of all those bands in my late teens early 20s i think genesis might be the only one that i still will pop on or gentle giant but I, I completely get all that. So I, when I hear those bands playing that, it's like, I get excited. I'm like, oh, that's cool. They're in that phase of their life. I love that, you know? Um, yeah. Just like I was probably, you know? Right. So, yeah. But I don't I don't stay in tune with it that much, you know? Are, how do you guys feel about the progressive side? Well, uh, here's the thing. I, I, let, let me add two things real quick, Zoltan. Yeah. yeah you, sure. you mentioned the whole hip-hop, uh, underground rap, whatever. Yeah. It's funny because I have a friend. He's a progressive artist. He's a keyboard player. He does a lot of ambiance, jazz, classical, and the funky rap stuff. And he does that. He creates like this ambiance 
progressive rap kind of song where he like you know writes rhymes and he's kind of rapping his name is Derek right I think I've seen him and I never like I was never really even thinking that would be possible until like I met this kid like last year and he's all into that he's all into that kind of stuff and also uh, uh, then you have things like uh, um, you know where even like progressive pop is a thing I know I don't know if you guys heard of Ben called Anathema where yeah, it's like love Anathema yeah and you know the stuff like that and and, and the the new generation like you said you got to be a little bit easier because right like for example genesis what? my friend my friend josh his father is a drummer he grew up like you know his two favorite bands is yes and rush but he didn't know the early genesis stuff his father never got into the early Genesis, like you know trick of the tail foxtrot and selling england yeah and I started listening this year on the album in the car with him. He's like, who the hell is that? Is that Phil Collins? Is that Peter Graham? I'm like, yeah, that's Genesis. I'm like, isn't Genesis like a pop rock band? I'm like, no, that's their early stuff, man. That's when Peter was in the band. He's like, <laughs> my dad never showed me this? Like, So he's just getting to all that. You know what I mean? Wow. Yeah. Wow. I, no, I, dude, that makes complete sense. That's why I, I would never say anything negative. Because it's like, it's a, it's like a, you come into it, it's a, a new fresh thing there's an album i listened to a couple of years ago it was by a guy he's a singer songwriter folk guy i'm not a huge fan of but he put out this album yeah. called ouroboros it's by a guy named uh, Ray yes. and uh dude it's like it's like it's like combination of dark side of the moon meets talk talks you know spirit of eden kind of a thing where it's, wow. a, it's a you know what wrote it, he, he wrote it for for vinyl like we did for our 2012 album specifically for vinyl so you had to be careful of the time of it, right? Because vinyl's a temporal, it's behold the time. And it's yeah. just, it's like, it's a short album that plays through from the beginning to the end. Everything's connected. My Morning Jacket guy is actually, uh, the singer produced it, the band played it. It's just a really interesting album. And when I heard it, I was like, well, that's a pretty progressive album. I saw that towards guys. Everybody left when he came out. He played a bunch huh. of his hits. He's like, I now I want to play my new album. And he played it straight through. Everybody left. And I'm wow. standing there. And I'm like, this is unbelievable. This is like one of the greatest things. Like the sun was coming down. It was an upside show. I got to see it. And that's like a singer-songwriter guy that plays it like, you know, that's into, you know, AAA radio or something. And here he's playing this. And I'm like, this is unbelievable. Great. Wow. Um, so my thoughts on the progressive rock scene in the U.S., um, it's, it's very much like, uh, you know, you have, you have these specific bands that really did, um, solidify the sound in their, in their individual countries. For example, from, um, from Sweden, you have bands like, uh, Wobbler and, um, Flower Kings. I think, um, Anglegard is also in there as well, even though I think, yeah, those uh, guys are I, my think generation. I think, uh, Anglegard's actually from Norway, but I might be wrong about that. Um, from from Italy, I mean, you have Banco releasing new new music, but I think when it comes down to um, the U.S., you have bands like Kansas, who had um, albums like The Point of No Return, Left Overture, and um, you have uh, Ambrosia with their debut and um, Somewhere I've Never Traveled, both uh, engineered and produced by um, and Alan Parsons. Obviously, uh, you have the... Um, uh, Glass Hammer, and y you have a Dream Theater, of course, and these are all contributing bands to the progressive rock scene in the U.S. Also, progressive metal was the uh, rising factor with like bands along with uh, influenced by and uh, written like Queensrÿche, and um, of course Dream Theater as well. So, yeah, warning, cans, face warning. Um, yeah, but I think that the biggest one. The biggest uh, prog rock band to hit the scene in the U.S. was probably Kansas with um, uh, Left Overture and The Point of No Return. Right. I'd add Blue, Blue Oyster Cult to that, too. Blue I'd Oyster also, Cult in uh, some ways, yeah. Zappa and the Mothers. Yeah, the Mothers of Invention. Yeah, that's true. Um, yeah. You have Zappa. One Size yeah, Fits All. One all that kind of stuff. One Size Fits All. All that kind of stuff. Yeah, for sure. But here's my thing. If we're talking more about like the modern scene... I probably would agree with Brad about like how I think a lot of the bands are just rehashing the same old thing. They're not trying anything new. And, you know, it's been pretty stagnant. Like the most, you know, the biggest bands that I've been seeing lately are like the gent bands, but everybody sounds the same. Everybody's using the same pedal, the same guitar. 
Yeah, so I, th- I do agree. It's kind of getting a little boring right now. I feel like we need some somebody to like do something different. And I think a lot of times we're seeing that more in you know, maybe it's rap or maybe it's it's the pop world or the indie world or the post rock world where they're starting to do different, you know, more unique things. In my opinion. Yeah. I, I agree. Yeah, it's, it's like, it's, like that's that's a lot of like obsession over syncopation and down tune. Oh guitar, yeah. That, I don't mind yeah. it. I don't mind stuff too. If it's creative, I'll listen to it. If it's like Haken, that's why I like Haken and then Lepers. That's probably the oh, only two can, bands yeah, I can tolerate sure. using an eight string guitar because they get quirky, they get jazzy, they get all of the above. And then you have the other bands who kind of try to copy that, but they sound a lot generic. Like Ryan said, too, everybody has a jump into a model guitar, everybody has a key oh, yeah. guitar, everybody has yeah. a, you know, and the, the same formula amp. and too much syncopation. Yeah, and too much syncopation. Like everybody thinks they have to do syncopation all the time. You know what right. I mean? It's yeah, progressive. As, as Brett said, it's not really you know. Of that course. That term is it, it's just now it's just a style. It's just like you are progressive if you sound like a another prog band, but you're right. not really wrestling the genre. Yeah, and yeah, of that's, course. that's exactly. It. I've always I've always felt that way. Anyway, just like every album should just do something a little bit different. I mean, mm-hmm. I have to feel like I'm moving ahead and trying different things rather than just rehashing. It seems like a lot of metal bands these days. Like, what are bands um, like? Uh, do you guys consider them progressive? Like, say, um, Car Bomb or a Dillinger Escape Plan, stuff like that. Is that like that's like heavy syncopated metal? It's like math rocky kind of stuff. You know? I've I've heard a big yeah. call like math core. That's what I've yeah. Heard. That's okay. what I've yeah, heard. Math label. core. I've heard I've heard a Dillinger Escape Plan be called a lot of different things. Math but, core, prog math metal, core, prog you know, metal, death um, core. Tech death. I mean, I've heard of. Yeah, I mean, Jesus. Uh, I mean, you know, I think that, like, again, I mean, it completely depends on you know the subgenre in which these bands fit in. Because, like, that's. I think that that's one of the reasons why we have these subgenres on ban- on websites like Prog Archives, so that these there are bands that have their signature sound and they stick to them. For example, I mean, you have. Um, I mean, sometimes this, these bands always change their sounds. I mean, I can't compare Selling England, the uh, symphonic prog album that is symphonic prog galore, to Duke, which is more crossover. I mean, you can't you can't compare those two as symphonic because Duke is more crossover, and you know you have Selling prog. England, Selling England, which is more symphonic. But you have um, modern symphonic rock prog bands like Anglegard and and uh, Wobbler and uh, Flower Kings and Echoland, who um, do try to keep the symphonic prog genre alive. Which, by the way, that's why I I love bands like those. Then um, IQ has been uh, doing that with. Um, um, albums like The Road of Bones and Resistance, they keep that more symphonic sound alive with a little bit of a heavier tone, which um, since Kansas dropped their new album, which was uh, The the Absence of Presence, I think, um, I found it to be both... I, I was, it wasn't my thing necessarily, but it, it was right. definitely still contributing to the progressive rock scene in, in the U.S., so as open, we're we're getting really close to the four o'clock time and getting pre- pre- where we should be wrapping things up. I think yep. I just wanted to say one thing to uh, uh, about the uh, you know the '70s progressive rock stuff is that uh, you know having played in a progressive rock band and been obsessed with all these those early '70s bands between the early '80s and up until my band disbanded in the '90s, is that after that I didn't really listen to very much of that stuff. Um, for you know two decades, I listened to Pat Metheny and things like that. And uh, I, you know, Brett, it's you know, you get a you get a, a 15 year old son and he wants to go through the entire catalog of ELP for a month, and then two months later, <laughs> he wants to go through the entire catalog of Genesis, and you get to see the, the light in his eyes because that's all brand new to him. Yeah, mm. and, uh, yeah, it's a it's an it's an unbelievable thing to watch your kids fall in love with the exact same stuff you fell in love with. Yeah, that's, 30 years ago. Yeah, that's what happened with me. I mean, you know, it, it's an inspiration for me. And I think that I, 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 I fall for bands that, you know, my dad introduced me to Echolin and now I'm, I mean, we're all talking to you now, which to be perfectly fair, I mean, 
I never in a million years thought I would be talking to um, a person from a band that I admire. Not in the. Tr- I never thought I would do that ever. And I think that that's what my dad is trying to um, bring forth as well because, you know, I've uh, we've been trying to uh, continue the uh, prog band um, that uh, uh, Benjamin's Kite. We are, you know, we're trying our best to uh, continue this prog scene. And I think that, you know, if if I didn't have that inspiration from bands like Echo Lynn and all these other bands that I enjoy, then that my dad introduced me to, then, <laughs> you know, I mean, where would I be now? Yeah. Yeah. That's beautiful. I love that, man. Yeah. So, uh, really cool. so uh, Brett, thank you very, very much for coming on. Yeah. This was an extremely enjoyable. Hour. I completely yeah. agree. It was, I had a Absolutely blast. a pleasure guys. I, it's so nice to meet you guys. And, um, I know, yeah, send me any things that you want to turn me on to or links that you guys are working on. Or I, I, I love music, so I'd love to be part of it. See, <laughs> especially now after getting to know you guys a little bit. It'd be yeah, cool for sure. Right. Yeah, yeah sure. I'd love that. I'll definitely keep in contact for sure. Yeah, thank you. The pleasure's been all mine, guys. It's an honor. So thank you yeah. for taking the time and it was a being interested too. in my music. Great. Yeah, for oh, sure. Whatever. It's all right. Hey, top 10 favorite band of all know, time. Uh, let me know when you guys are going to uh, put this up too, and I'll you know, just get it out there on our Facebook page and so forth and so on. Yeah, okay. all right. That's, that's great. Right, Thanks very much. Thank you. Everybody, nice to meet you, Brian. Thanks. Uh, you too, Brett. See you, brother. Thank See you, so you guys. Much. See you. Bye. Peace. Keep in contact. Yeah. Bye. And.